On this Monday night, celebration and deadly violence in the Middle East. Demonstrators are killed at the Gaza border. Israel says its troops acted in self-defense. Palestinians call it a massacre. While in Jerusalem, the United States opens its controversial embassy. So where does that leave the peace process and Donald Trump's role in it? Also tonight, a new theory in the biggest aviation mystery of our time. A Canadian investigator on what happened to MH370 and why he says the pilot is to blame. And who will walk Meghan Markle down the aisle? Questions tonight about her father and whether he'll attend the royal wedding. This is The National. The region was already simmering. People in Gaza have been protesting Israel's economic blockade for weeks. And this day, Israel's 70th anniversary was expected to see those protests intensify. And for Palestinians, the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem only fueled even more anger, more protest. The response was deadly in one of the most violent days the region has seen in months. <laughs> Thousands of demonstrators advanced on the border fence that separates Gaza from Israel, urged by loudspeakers and people waving Palestinian flags to get closer, get closer. Some threw rocks or fired slingshots as the air grew thick with smoke from burning tires and tear gas dropped from Israeli drones. The Israeli military accused some in the crowd of being terrorists, trying to plant explosives by the fence or tear it down to gain access to Israeli communities. Soldiers opened fire, killing more than 50 Palestinians, including eight children. About 2,500 Palestinians were wounded, according to their health authority, half reportedly by live fire. It was the highest one-day death toll since protests began six weeks ago and, indeed, since the 2014 Gaza War. By afternoon, Palestinians began burying their dead. And by evening, Hamas had called the protesters home. But their anger won't end here. Palestinians want East Jerusalem to be the capital of a future Palestinian state. Israel views the entire city as its eternal and indivisible capital. Most of the world, including Canada, believes the city's status should be determined by an eventual peace settlement. But as Derek Stoffel tells us, that didn't stop the celebrations in Jerusalem today. For many Israelis, this was an historic day when their country's closest ally, the United States, stood at odds with almost all of the international community and recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. At the twilight's last gleaming. At the heart of President Trump's controversial decision is this, the new U.S. Embassy. On behalf... His daughter Ivanka on hand to dedicate the, the building. The president spoke in a video message. Today we officially opened the United States Embassy in Jerusalem. Congratulations. It's been a long time coming. Trump's point man on Middle president East peace, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, to told the crowd the that the American president embassy. is a man who follows through on his promises. We have shown the world once again that the United States can be trusted. We stand with our friends and our allies. Israelis and Americans gathered near the embassy to celebrate. It's the right thing to do. It may not be the popular thing to do with liberal leftists, but it's the right thing to do. While well, most Israelis support Trump's decision to move the embassy, a small but vocal minority came out to back the Palestinians. Leading to angry confrontations here in Jerusalem as well. Israelis left versus right. You don't need to speak Hebrew to understand the anger. Not long after this pro-Palestinian demonstration began, the police decided enough was enough. Seizing Palestinian flags and banners, detaining a handful of protesters. They are afraid of the Palestinian flag, which is a symbol of a nation struggling in order to be free. <laughs> over the relocation of the U.S. Embassy is expected to spill into tomorrow, the day when Palestinians will once again take to the streets in demonstrations against both Israel and the United States. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. 
Now, U.S. presidents on both sides of the political divide had promised this move but failed to deliver once in office. In part, that's because a lot of the foreign policy establishment in Washington and beyond sees it as pouring gasoline on the fire. So, how did Trump get here? Keith Bogue explores that question. Jared Kushner's appointment as his father-in-law's Middle East advisor was an early signal of how the Trump administration would handle one of the world's most contentious hot zones. Drafting a peace plan would not be left to the elites of the State Department. Kushner, who has no foreign policy experience and has not been approved for White House security clearance, has a more valuable currency, a familial relationship with a president who is demonstrating a new level of support for Israel. President Trump acknowledged another truth and kept another promise. He announced his intention to exit the dangerous, flawed, and one-sided Iran deal. That decision was applauded then by supporters of Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and again today with a standing ovation for Kushner. How much things have changed. When Barack Obama was president, his relationship with Netanyahu was so bad, he wasn't even consulted when Republicans invited the Israeli Prime Minister to speak to a joint meeting of Congress. The Prime Minister of Israel, His Excellency Benjamin Netanyahu. And Netanyahu used that nationally televised moment to undermine Obama's efforts to negotiate with Iran on its nuclear weapons program. It doesn't block Iran's path to the bomb. It paves Iran's path to the bomb. He drew an analogy to Nazi Germany and cast Obama as the weak-willed appeaser. I can only urge the leaders of the world not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Trump is now making moves that could have a huge impact on the Middle East. Beyond keeping his campaign promises, it's not clear what the strategy is or whether there even is one. <laughs> to Palestinians, Trump's advisers seem anything but impartial about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They look like, they, are, they, they sound like they are the spokespersons for the Israeli government, not for the United States. The Trump administration is not the first to believe it is making history on the road to peace in the Middle East. And if things don't go as hoped, it won't be the first to find that optimism is just a momentary state of mind. Keith Bogue, CBC News, Washington. Now, no one from Canada was at the opening today. Global Affairs says the event was a bilateral ceremony between Israel and the United States. And as such, Canada was not invited. But Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland tweeted her dismay at today's violence, saying this, We are saddened by deaths and injuries that occurred today and over past weeks. It is inexcusable that civilians, journalists and children have been victims. Here's a quick look at what else we're working on tonight on The National. We take you inside and underneath Douma. The Syrian rebel stronghold injured a years-long siege, and Margaret Evans takes a tour of the underground tunnels where people hid to survive. Kensington Palace responds to reports that the father of the bride may be absent from Windsor Castle on Sunday. But first, the southern BC interior has already endured historic flooding, and it's not over yet. Residents were hoping for a break this week for flooding along several rivers to start receding. Instead, they're bracing for another wave of water. The city of Grand Forks was the hardest hit of two dozen communities that declared states of emergency over the last few days. It sits where the Granby and Kettle Rivers meet, and both are expected to surge again. But dozens upon dozens of homes there are still underwater. Nearly 3,000 people remain under evacuation order. And that hot sun shining down on them today, well, it's the reason new trouble is coming. Today, Briar Stewart got exclusive access inside the flood zone. It's a look inside an area still off limits to most. Yeah, that's all pretty flooded out. With the CBC camera rolling, Grand Fork search and rescue went from home to home looking for pets so residents wouldn't try to come back themselves. There's a risk of residents entering uh, the contaminated water, which is still very dangerous. There's a lot of raw sewage and chemicals in the water. And for some, the houses they left behind last week are nearly unrecognizable. I knew it was going to be bad. I knew everything was going to be destroyed. I didn't realize that the water would be able to literally move things from room to room. Oh, my goodness. This is the first time Kyle and Jaylee Piper oh, have seen inside the home 
where they lived with their 11-year-old daughter. My daughter's room's destroyed. They fled Thursday evening, but without one of their cats. Kyle returned on Friday by canoe, but couldn't make it through the whole house to look for him. I didn't know how to tell the, my wife how bad things were. I showed her a picture, and it was, like, it was the hardest thing to, to tell her. They had just moved into the rental property two months ago, and now their entire block is underwater. The flooding in this neighborhood was so bad because the water broke through a dike, and it's a barrier that officials are now trying to fix before more water heads this way. That's expected to happen later this week as high temperatures are quickly melting the mountain snowpack. That's Heartbreaking. It's devastating. devastating. As for the Pipers, they're living in a trailer for now. While they've learned that most of their belongings are ruined, hey, kitty. There is some good news. The search and rescue crew did find Mikey the cat. I can't even explain it. It was like the best thing in the world. A huge relief when so many other parts of their lives are still sitting submerged. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Grand Forks. Let's take you to London now, where the pomp and pageantry of the royal wedding is being overshadowed tonight. There are reports that Meghan Markle's father may skip the ceremony after his efforts to win over the public backfired. Meghan Markle was supposed to walk arm in arm with her father down the aisle of St. George's Chapel. But now it's not clear whether Thomas Markle will be there at all. The 73-year-old lives in Mexico now and reportedly told journalists there he's not coming. All of this following a series of photos of Thomas preparing for his daughter's big day looking at pictures of the royal couple at an internet cafe and being fitted for a suit. Turns out they were staged. Thomas Markle is seen in this CCTV image arriving at that cafe with a photographer in tow. Today, Meghan Markle's estranged half-sister took the blame, tweeting, the media was unfairly making him look bad, so I suggested he do positive photos for his benefit and the benefit of the royal family. We had no idea he would be taken advantage of. It was not for money. Just hours later, TMZ reported that Thomas has had a change of heart, that he regrets taking the photos and doesn't want to embarrass his daughter. Kensington Palace isn't denying the report, just saying late tonight, this is a deeply personal moment for Ms. Markle in the days before her wedding. She and Prince Harry ask again for understanding and respect to be extended to Mr. Markle in this difficult situation. With the wedding just five days away, there's now one more big decision to make who will walk the future royal down the aisle. So with the wedding preps underway, we are getting ready as well. Adrian's in the UK tonight as we get set to cover all the angles of the royal wedding. On Wednesday, she'll bring you the national from London. Thursday and Friday, she'll be in Windsor. And don't forget to set your alarms and your coffee makers. Adrian begins bright and early Saturday morning. We'll give you a front row seat to the wedding of the year beginning at 4 a.m. Eastern. Watch the royal wedding, Harry and Meghan, on CBC Television, CBC News Network, and cbcnews.ca. She better bring back some souvenirs. Still ahead tonight <laughs> on The National, the secrets of Duma, Syria. Margaret Evans takes us inside and underground. That's next. Plus, a stunning new theory about what happened to MH370 from a Canadian crash investigator. He'll take you through it just ahead. And in tonight's national documentary, you'll meet a young Torontonian who just fulfilled a lifelong dream by being drafted in a brand new sports league. Called me and they said, Yusuf Abdullah, you made it through the Dono 2. And I was I just started jumping out of my seat. I was like, wow, you know, I dream come true. The images still disturb. More than a month later, children seeming to suffer from a chemical attack, likely chlorine gas and sarin, according to doctors. The attack on Duma, attributed to the Syrian regime, reportedly killed 70 people and injured 500. And it seemed to be a breaking point for the rebels who had long defended this stronghold. The very next day, they agreed to surrender the area. Since then, we've seen little beyond desolate scenes of the, after of the aftermath. Tonight, 
though, you're going to see so much more. As the regime takes over and roots out the remnants of opposition, the CBC's Margaret Evans got rare access to Duma. What she found there gives the clearest picture yet of how the rebels persisted and what they now face in defeat. There is a dreamlike quality to Duma that's hard to shake, imagery so surreal that you struggle to sweep the cobwebs from your mind. After withstanding years of siege, the rebel-held city fell to the Syrian army last month after a ferocious bombing campaign, including an alleged chemical weapons attack. Damascus insists it never happened, that the rebels staged it. About 50,000 people are still here, little shoots of life springing up against the odds in the midst of all the destruction. The only bicycle repair shop in town doing a thriving business. I'm not leaving, says Mohammed, a father of five. He heard reports of a chemical attack, he says, but smelled nothing himself. People are friendly, but entry to and from Duma is strictly controlled by Russian soldiers. They negotiated the surrender and exit of holdout rebels, mainly from the Army of Islam. A few journalists have been allowed to visit, not so much to see what's up top, but what lies beneath. A vast network of tunnels rebel fighters are said to have created under the city, some of them big enough to drive a truck through. Duma was an opposition stronghold right from the very start of the war. The rebels here managed to survive until last month. These tunnels would have helped them do so. Damascus says their sophistication proves that rebels are funded by countries like Saudi Arabia, waging a proxy war. Opposition activists say people were driven underground to survive. When we visited Douma in 2012, the uprising against Bashar al-Assad was evolving into a full-on civil war. Opposition activists could only demonstrate under the cover of darkness, already barricading themselves in against government tanks. The siege would begin a year later. Fast forward to today's tunnels and the bright lights of a hospital waiting room connected to them. Rasoon Masmoud and her sister tell us they survived the siege by eating barley and staying below ground. Because it was dangerous to walk on the streets or even in the house, she says. She's no fan of the rebels, saying they prevented them from leaving even as they were starving. Her 10-year-old son and her sister's baby are stunted, she says, for lack of food. The region was once known as the breadbasket of Damascus, but it's watched as its crops were withered by war and its people dispersed to the four winds. Undulating lines of laundry mark out a refugee camp called Herjila, south of Damascus, sheltering some 16,000 people from East Ghouta, which includes Duma. There is a quiet sense of recovery in the camp, the need to keep still. People have lived through so much, says Hesham Natur. You can't describe it. There was no justice. Natur says he made a mistake not leaving Duma at the start of the war, but he had a home and a business and was reluctant to leave. We kept saying it would be over soon, he says. He and his wife Naja lost their one-year-old son, they say, when the rebels refused them permission to travel for medical help. There is no freedom to come and go from this camp without permission, according to aid workers, who say the government is screening, looking for opponents or young men who've avoided military service. And the sense of organized control is another sign of what seems to be an inevitable march to victory for Bashar al-Assad, at least in terms of Syria's civil war. It's not clear when or how many of East Ghouta's displaced will find their way back home. Out of a pre-war population of 400,000, only a quarter remain. As for Duma, 
It's since been visited by UN chemical weapons inspectors looking into the alleged April attack. But reports that Syrian doctors are being silenced by government intimidation have reinforced fears for some that any evidence that did exist was swept away before the inspectors even arrived in country. The fugue state continues. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Duma. Margaret and her team on the ground in Douma told a number of stories during their time there, and they captured, as you see, dramatic images that are worth countless words. You can find their work on the Nationals' Instagram page. Toronto will lose to the Cavaliers for the third consecutive postseason. Well, that was a tough moment for Canadian basketball fans. A week ago, the Toronto Raptors swept by the Cleveland Cavaliers and eliminated from the NBA playoffs. There's still at least another month of playoff action that will run right into June, but away from the main stage, the NBA has been assembling a whole other league of play, an experimental one. To make it work, they've gathered some of the top basketball talent in the world. Caught up in the action, a young Canadian from Toronto, in fact. He's about to make it big, and he says he's ready to take the world of pro basketball by storm. Andrew Chang met him, but first Andrew stopped in New York City to see for himself what basketball 2.0 looks like. You're looking at a new breed of pro basketball. 102 of the world's best in their sport are here inside New York's Madison Square Garden for a real NBA draft. But if you haven't heard of these young prospects like Moody, I'm So Far Ahead, Splash King, or Dines, that's because you don't play NBA 2K. This is what the NBA believes could be its next big moneymaker, a new league built around a video game, their video game. But instead of Isaiah Thomas, Kyle Lowry, or LeBron James, players will be controlling virtual versions of themselves. There will be franchises, a regular season, a million dollar prize pool, and with more than a million people who play this game every day, a potential for huge audiences wanting to see the best of the best. Is this for real? Ask the guy running the show, Brendan Donahue. This isn't blind optimism. We know we have had success with this, and I think now if we put the weight of the NBA, of 2K, of our 17 teams, we put the weight behind it actually and to, you know, to take a run at this, I, I think there's, uh, there's an audience there that's, that's, that's waiting for us. And consider what really sets this league apart. Every single team here is owned and operated by its real-life NBA counterpart. Maps Gaming selects our Treo Boy, a.k.a. Dimes, from Cleveland, Ohio. And so, get drafted here today by Mavs Gaming, and in a very real way, you are playing for the Dallas Mavericks. That's where the NBA comes in. What we wanted to stay committed to was, let's truly find the best 102 players in the world, and then we'll work to kind of unleash their personalities and their, their personal makeup and, like, help turn them into stars. And this is their day. And right here, a few rows from the front, 25-year-old Yusuf Abdullah. He's a Toronto boy, a bit out of his element, but he couldn't be more ready for his life to transform right here, right now. Growing up, it was tough. I've moved a lot. Our family wasn't that wealthy. We've lived in Toronto community housing. Basketball was definitely an escape for me. It took me outside of reality. It was just a dream. When I played the sport, it, I, didn't, I didn't stress about anything. Once I picked it up and I started shooting hoops, I was in love with the game. When you were starting out, were you any good? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm good now. <laughs> But it was important to you. Definitely. It was, it was definitely important to me, you know, because I've been 
growing up in tough neighborhoods, you know, where there was gang violence, there's drug deals going on. Um, there was one of my friends, his name was Samatar Farah. He got shot and killed in Chester Lee, and uh, it was tough. It was tough to handle. Um, sorry. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's, he's, it's, hard, it's hard to think back to those days. Yeah, he's, uh, he's one of the nicest guys in the world, and that's what my parents fought and argued with me every night to, to, to stay, you know, to, to stay home and to, to be in places where you'd be safe. Yusuf and Samatar were like brothers. They grew up playing ball together, but Samatar's death really hit home. It was a sign of how dangerous the neighborhood had become over the years. And if staying safe meant staying home, in a way, NBA 2K was a path back out, a new escape, a new passion even. And Yusuf was good. I was in the top three ranks, and and we were, we were destroying teams, and, and that's the way I like it. That's what I do. I pummel teams left and right and center. <laughs> When Yusuf starts thinking and talking basketball, real or virtual, there is a fire within. Bravado, yes, but backed up by a real life basketball IQ. Green, let's go, boy. Tell me, man, I can't stop you. Too easy. I gotta worry about the, the cuts, I gotta worry about the rebounds, I gotta make sure I, or I box out, play the pick and roll. Quick fingers and a quick mind, plus a serious work ethic. Yusuf plays more than 40 hours a week on top of being a full-time student. So, you love the game, clearly. You work hard at the game. Tell me about that moment where you're thinking, hey, there's a pro league that I could be playing in right now. Wow. When I, when I heard about the news and that the NBA is going to be involved, and I was like, wow, this is a second chance of making the NBA. I really pushed it to the limit, and there it is. I told you, man, money. So how many people have a dream just like Yusuf's? Turns out, a lot. More than a million people tried out, but after two grueling months, only 102 would make the cut. And waiting to find out who did? Boy, let me tell you, that was the longest week and a half of my life. Next thing you know, I get a phone call from New York. This must be it. And I picked it up, I got it. They called me and they said, Yusuf Abdullah, you made it to the 102. And I was, it just started jumping out of my seat. I was like, wow, you know, I, a dream come true. I was so happy. I was like, wow, it was just, that feeling was indescribable. I felt like I won a million dollars. But while Yusuf was basking in his dream, being realized, making the draft, he also had a big problem. Let's, uh, let me give you a little background story. My parents, uh, they're really not a fan of me playing the game. To this day, they still don't, don't want me to be in, in, the, in the 2K League. They want to tell their friends that, um, you know, I'm a doctor, and they don't want to tell them that uh, my son's a professional video game player. Like, how they, they would feel embarrassed, and that's how they, that's how they told me straight up in, in, while I was playing the game, and I felt disappointed. And coming, that, coming from your parents, it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, and it's like, I wish, you know, if you supported me, and, you know, being there for me, I feel like I'd, it would take, push me to the moon. I don't plan on stopping. I want to be the Jordan of, of the NBA 2K League. The day before the draft, all I could think while I was getting a haircut was, wow, um, I, I, gotta, I gotta look good. You know, I, I have to, I told my barber, you have to make sure this is the best cut you've ever given me. There's going to be a bunch of people. The NBA TV is going to be watching the, the Twitch. So it had, it had to be a great cut. 
I was just thinking about all those hours that I put in, and it's like, wow, you know, and all that hard work paid off. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the NBA 2K League Draft Live from Hulu Theater at Madison Square Garden. History is going to be made here today, 102 live. While I'm walking towards Madison Square Garden, I was speechless. I was pinching myself, thinking to myself, wow, is this really a dream? Am I dreaming right now? I'm in New York, Madison Square Garden, the Big Apple. Draft day. Ask any of the 102 guys here, this spectacle is a cruel mix of absolute elation and stomach-turning nausea. What am I thinking? I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I'm, I don't know what team I'm going to go to. You know, where, 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 where am I going to end up going? Today, the rules of the game are simple. Already in the bag, a six-month contract and a minimum guarantee of just over $40,000. But the catch, you have no say and no idea which city you'll be going to. You get picked, you pack your bags. Jazz Gaming selects Kings Guard Gaming, selects Laser 5 Gaming, selects One Wild Walnut Center in California. Where is my name? Where is my name? I can't believe it's been this long. I want, I want to just be picked, and I want to, I want to know where I'm going. If the Raptors don't pick me, I'm away from home. Raptors pick me up. That's all I'm thinking about. And then, it happens. With the 11th pick of the third round of the 2018 NBA 2K League Draft, Raptors Uprising GC selects Kobe Youssef. Center from Ontario, Canada. I just, I, I'm speechless. I'm so happy that I'm playing for my hometown. You know, I've always envisioned the Raptors winning a championship and that, um, you know, as a Canadian, I just want to bring a championship home. What were the odds, you might be asking? Well, there were only four other Canadians in the draft and the Raptors didn't pick any of them. They all went to American teams. You never know what'll happen on draft day. And at the end of the day, another surprise for Yusuf, a call from his dad. Toronto, that's where I'm at. I'm happy. You know, right, right there, right beside you, the fam. You know, and friends. Yeah, I got my dream. I got my dream right at home. You could tell, like, he was so happy that I got picked up by the Raptors, that I was staying home and I'm going to be near them. They were really proud of me, and uh, this is the first time uh, they were really supportive. I could tell they were supportive of me uh, playing 2K. During this inaugural NBA 2K season, Yusuf's going by the name Yusuf Scarbs, a nod to his roots in Scarborough, and his number, 35. It's what his close friend, Samatar, wore when they played basketball together, and it's a way, perhaps, to keep his memory close as Yusuf enters a whole new world. Raptors Uprising is off to a rocky start as the NBA 2K League kicked off its regular season this weekend. And Raptors Uprising needs to be getting consistent scores. If anything, you just have to keep trading blows back and forth, but they weren't able to again. It kind of goes In their first game, the Raptors trailed behind uh, from the start. Eventually losing to Mavs Gaming, that bad luck followed them to their second game where the Raptors lost in overtime to a team owned by the Boston Celtics. You never have to work out in that league. More to come tonight on The National, but first, tributes are pouring in tonight for a Canadian-born actor who took on some iconic roles. She is best remembered for the dizzying heights she reached in Hollywood. In the blockbuster Superman film, she showed wit and grit as reporter Lois Lane. But Margot Kidder did a lot more than that. 
Robert Redford is, it turns out, is delightful to work with because I've worked with him, but there are some stars who have obnoxious, pretentious, I can't say what I was going to say, but idiots. Born in Yellowknife, she had dreamed of achieving fame as an actor. Her first breakout role was as James Garner's strikingly independent love interest in an offbeat series about the Old West. <laughs> I don't want your help. Thank you very much. You great big man, you. She added spice to the Canadian horror classic Black Christmas as a foul-mouthed sorority sister. You know, for a public servant, I think your attitude really sucks. And her famous dates included Pierre Trudeau as well as Steven Spielberg and Richard Pryor. But Kidder had suffered since childhood from undiagnosed bipolar disorder. In 1996, she suffered a very public breakdown in Los Angeles. Well, initially it was mortifying. Kidder became a political activist and was arrested outside the White House in 2011 during a protest against Trans Canada's Keystone XL pipeline. Today, her family said her passion and commitment to the arts, civil and indigenous people's rights, mental health and the environment were inspirations to us all and epitomized in her work. Margot Kidder died Sunday in her Montana home. She was 69. Tonight on The National, a visit to hospital for the U.S. president after First Lady Melania Trump underwent kidney surgery. The procedure taking place this morning, it's said to have gone well. According to the White House, the First Lady was treated for a benign medical condition. She's expected to spend the rest of the week recovering in hospital. Also tonight, news that federal Green Party leader Elizabeth May has been charged with criminal contempt of court for her role in an anti-pipeline protest. She was arrested in March alongside NDP MP Kennedy Stewart while protesting Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain Project. Stewart pleaded guilty this morning and was handed a $500 fine. May is expected to appear in court later this month. Suspended New Democrat MP Christine Moore responded today to the allegations leveled against her. Last week, a Canadian military veteran made claims of sexual misconduct during an interaction five years ago. But as Katie Simpson tells us, Moore's account of what happened back in 2013 is very different than his. Christine Moore says the relationship was consensual, loving and fun, even if brief. During an emotional news conference today, the NDP MP denied allegations she took advantage of Corporal Glenn Kirkland. I've done nothing but cry since the claims were made public, she said, describing allegations of sexual misconduct as lies. Moore confirmed she invited Kirkland and others to her office for a drink after the Afghan veteran testified at a House of Commons committee in 2013. She says the door was open and staff were present. Later that day, she says they met for another drink, this time at an Ottawa patio. When she had to return to the office, she says he tagged along, kissed her, and tried to take off her clothes. Moore claims she stopped the encounter out of fear of being caught, but later accepted an invitation to Kirkland's hotel room. She says that was the start of a four-month romance. He says, not true. I made an emotional testimony, and then she took advantage of her position to prey on, on someone who's clearly in a vulnerable spot. Kirkland says Moore's behaviour was inappropriate because of an imbalance of power. She was the Member of Parliament, he was the witness at a committee. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has suspended Moore from her caucus duties pending the results of an independent investigation into the matter. Both Moore and Kirkland say they will cooperate with that process. If I was a female and she was a male, Think about how different our interview would be right now. Moore is now threatening to sue Kirkland for defamation, along with three journalists, including a CBC opinion columnist. But she has not yet filed any paperwork. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Now to a new report on Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 that reaches a disturbing conclusion about why it disappeared. A four-year search of the depths of the Indian Ocean has failed to locate the plane which vanished with 239 people aboard. Now, an investigation by Larry Vance, a retired air crash investigator with Canada's Transportation Safety Board, says the evidence is clear. The pilot deliberately crashed into the Indian Ocean in what Vance believes was a mass murder-suicide that was carefully planned. 
What happened aboard MH370 is as puzzling as it was unprecedented. About 40 minutes after takeoff, it disappeared from radar. Its transponder stopped broadcasting. But military radar detected the plane veering inexplicably off course. And later, a maintenance computer started sending signals, seven in all, to a satellite. That confirmed to investigators the jet continued to fly for six more hours southward to the Indian Ocean. They assumed MH370 must have become a ghost flight. The pilot somehow incapacitated, the plane eventually running out of fuel, spiraling from cruising altitude to the ocean. That theory led to two massive searches which turned up nothing. Now, a veteran Canadian air crash investigator says the officials made what he calls a glaring mistake, failing to properly study the only physical evidence of the crash. Larry Vance was one of the main investigators of the 1998 Swiss air crash south of Halifax. In a new book, Vance says he's certain one of MH370's pilots remained in control until he landed on the water. Vance has done a detailed analysis of the wreckage that washed ashore, including this key piece, a flap. He says it has signs, so-called witness marks, which show it was deployed by a pilot and then scraped against the water in a landing designed to keep the plane intact before it sank. Vance says if there had been an uncontrolled dive, the flap would have been extensively damaged and there would have been thousands of pieces of floating debris. And Larry Vance joins us from Ottawa. You don't have the, the data recorders here, Larry. You have very little from the plane itself. How can you be so sure of your conclusions? Ian, just by good circumstance, we have the exact pieces of wreckage that appeared on the coast of Africa to tell us exactly what happened at the end of the flight. We know from those pieces that the aircraft went into the ocean in, at, at a relatively low speed, normal ditching speed, and we know that it was under control by a pilot. And you also believe this shows the pilot had a goal here to do this undetected and, and for this plane never to be found. That's the exact intention of the pilot, in my opinion, and I don't think many people will argue with me after they see the evidence in the book. This airplane was landed on the surface of the ocean in such a way as to cause the least possible damage to make it go to the bottom all in one piece and to stay there undetected forever. That was the intention of the pilot, and he almost succeeded. Now, once you got to the, through the review of the evidence, you know, determining that the, this was a, a pilot control landing, and you plug it in with the other things we know, you were able to go through some of the other theories and, and, and eliminate them. And you show why it couldn't have been a missile that brought down this plane. It wasn't a fire that brought it down. But we do end up with two possibilities. One is a, a physical hijacking, and by that I mean somebody on board. And the other theory is a, a suicide mission by the pilot. Why do you feel it likely was not a hijacking? Well, Ian, I go through a quite a lengthy explanation in the book to explain why it wasn't a hijacking, but basically the sequence that happened doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with the beginning, where the transponder went off less than two minutes after the, the uh, last normal transmission from the pilot. It doesn't fit with the actions that were taken afterwards, and it certainly doesn't fit with the ending. A hijacking can be ruled out. We just have 20 seconds left. Uh, one thing you do not address in this book is why. Why would this pilot go on a suicide mission? Ian, I would leave that to, to experts in that field to determine. My, my uh, expertise is wreckage analysis and aircraft for accident reconstruction. I'll leave it to others to figure out why he would do that. And there is a detailed analysis in this book for sure, which is uh, available now. Larry Vance, thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. And you can go deeper on the stories of the day earlier in the day. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash The National. The National Today takes you inside our journalism every afternoon. All right, Jets fans, turn away. That was another goal for the Vegas Golden Knights. They beat Winnipeg 3-1 in tonight's game at Bell MTS Place. So the series tied one game apiece. Both teams now head to Vegas for Game 3 of the Western Conference Finals, set for Wednesday. And, of course, whichever team wins this series moves on to the Stanley Cup Final. He finds McDavid. Walking in McDavid with a chip. In, shoot, scores! Connor McDavid! 
Well, he was Sidney Crosby-like the World Hockey Championship today. Canada's team captain, Connor McDavid, batting in the puck from his own rebound to beat Latvia 2-1 in overtime. The Canadians play Germany in their final round-robin game tomorrow, but because of today's win, they're guaranteed a spot. Wow, I just love watching that in the quarterfinals. Okay, so a bucket of beef isn't usually <laughs> what comes to mind when you think children's birthday party, but that's exactly what Grace Hookie wanted. The five-year-old asked for salt meat, and that's what she got. This very Newfoundland-themed party is our moment of the day. You can't get on Pinterest and look up salt meat party. <laughs> So I said to Grace, I said, your birthday is next. So, you know, what sort of theme would you like or what sort of thing would you like to do for your birthday? Um, and she said, I want a salt meat party, Mom. So, Grace, why did you want a salt meat party? Because. Salt meat um, is essentially like beef that's put in a pickle um, to make it salty. Do you like salt meat? Yes. First thing I had to do was get someone to make the cakes. I asked my sister to get me some beef buckets, and so she got some beef buckets for me to use as decorations. So yeah, they, everyone enjoyed it. Everyone had a had a great time. <laughs> so part of the story, of course, yes. is unique to Newfoundland and Labrador, but part right. of it is kind of universal, right? It's what parents will do for their kids, especially little kids, for birthday cakes. My my wife, very proud of some hockey rinks she's uh, recreated over the years. One, I think, complete with some icing version uh, of a Zamboni. What about uh, in the Barton household? Any special uh, yeah. concoctions? Yes, yeah? uh, yes. I, I vividly remember a ladybug who had sparklers for antenna. That was for one Very of my nice. birthdays. Still remember it now, but I never remember asking for beef on my... <laughs> Cake. No we should point out that was not real. That was a vanilla cake, and Grace was very happy. <laughs> That's the National for Monday, May 14th. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>